Um, I'm Marina Fritsch, and together with Patricia Santian Cavantes, I'm very excited to welcome you to this first out of four sessions of our seminar series, Social Ecological Systems, a Global Conversation. The Social Ecological Systems Institute brings together researchers with diverse backgrounds who are engaged in social ecological systems research all around the world. And with this seminar series, we want to share our work with you, exchange ideas and start a global conversation. Today, we are going to hear from Jörn Fischer about key themes of social ecological systems research at Leuphana University. And after that, we will engage in a discussion together with Jörn, Berta Martin Lopez and all of you. We will record this talk and stop recording right before the discussion. And you can then ask your questions, share your ideas, share your thoughts with us. And please use the virtual raise hand function to do so. And now, without further ado, I welcome Bertha and Jörn, the heads of our institute, and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Marina. And um, first of all, hi, everyone. Uh, we are really, really happy to have you all here today. Many thanks for joining us uh, in this series of online um, global conversations on social ecological research. We are here today, well, I, first, I'm Berta Martin Lopez. I forgot that. I'm here today with Joan Fisher. There. Uh, we are co heads both of the Social Ecological Systems Institute at Lufana University, Lunebourg, in Germany. And um, Actually, today we are kicking off this series of online global conversation on social ecological systems research uh, with the presentation of the kind of research we are doing at the Institute and the kind of approach we have. But uh, we hope that you keep joining us over the next uh, months because we will host uh, new seminars on different topics that they will be introduced at the end of today. And uh, as Marina said, today we introduced the research on our institute. And I think that without further ado, I can zoom in on Joanne's picture. Okay, thank you. Welcome everyone. It's lovely to see so many people from all different parts of the world here. Um, with apologies to those of you who are in strange time zones and for whom it's not a very convenient time. Um, what I'd like to do today is just kick this off. It really is going to be a conversation, I hope, a conversation meaning not just us talking at you, but also um, you talking with us um, about social ecological systems. I'll start with a presentation um, of about half an hour, but then afterwards we have lots of time left um, to actually discuss what you perceive to be important questions or priorities for social ecological systems. So what I'd like to do is very briefly highlight um, why we founded the Social Ecological Systems Institute um, and then give a little bit of background of what we might actually mean by social ecological systems. I'll talk a little bit about where we work um, as well as who we are and also how we work, which is also an interesting question that perhaps isn't getting enough attention. And right at the end, give a bit of an outlook onto future events in this series, hoping that our conversation that we start today will continue. But first of all, why this institute? So I think we are happy to work at Leuphana University in northern Germany um, in the sense that it is one of very few universities around the world um, which explicitly focus in a non-trivial way on sustainability. We have our own faculty of sustainability of four faculties at, at the university. One of them is entirely devoted to sustainability. And within that faculty over the last decade or so, we've seen um, quite a strong growth in interest in social ecological systems. And with that taking place, it made sense to found this new institute so that people who have this interest in social ecological systems can come together and share and exchange insights. So I'll try to give an introduction into what we do here today, but think of that more as a way of um, providing some background to kickstart discussions that may be going different directions about social ecological systems. Three slides of background for you. Um, obviously, people who are signing in for this um, conversation know a lot of this stuff already, but it's good to remind ourselves as a little bit of background. So on the ecological side, the IPBS has shown us quite clearly that global ecosystems are in trouble. 
For example, 25% of species are now threatened with extinction, driven by direct drivers such as human land use, climate change and invasive species, and underpinned by indirect drivers such as demographic and sociocultural factors or institutions and governance that are just not working in quite the right way for sustainability just yet. So ecosystems are very much in trouble. When we look at human well-being, however, we also see a lot of problems around the world still, and um, this is just one indicator of human well-being, namely food security or food insecurity rather. And we see here that over the last few years, over the last six years, there's been a steady increase in food insecurity in various different parts of the world, especially on the continent of Africa, as we can see here, see here where a staggering over 60% of people or just about, sorry, just under 60% of people are affected by moderate or even severe food insecurity at this point in time. And this proportion is rising at the same time population growth is happening in Africa. And so we have huge numbers of people still struggling with human well-being as well. So ecosystems are in trouble. Human well-being is very much um, facing its own challenges in various different parts of the world. And just as a third background slide, I like to show this one here because it shows that environmental changes and social changes are also very much linked. Right now, we have um, only 0.8% of the planet's surface um, covered by areas that are black here where the, um, where the uh, annual temperature is more than 29 degrees on average. Those areas are predicted under climate change predictions to expand um, to cover a huge part of the globe such that we actually will have up to three and a half billion people living in conditions that right now are really very extreme conditions where hardly anybody lives by 2070. So very interesting social changes can be expected as a result of the environmental changes that are taking place. So this is just three slides of background to show there are ecological challenges, there are challenges to human well-being, and there are key links between those types of challenges that we need to deal with over the coming decades. A classic way to look at social ecological systems is to depict them a bit like this, where we say people use, modify, and care for nature, and nature in turn provides material and immaterial benefits back to people. That happens at a given in a given landscape, but it also um, happens across different spatial scales, so people influence nature elsewhere as well, and nature elsewhere influences people in remote locations as well. So it's all very much tied together in specific locations as well as across the globe and changing in a dynamic way through time. That's one depiction of social ecological systems that is often used. Another one that we like to use also at our institute is this idea of an iceberg, where we often look only at the surface of a social ecological system, um, not in our research, hopefully, but um, in terms of society, often only looks at the surface in the sense of events that are currently um, causing problems. So, for example, we see um, the event of a particular drought or the event of a particular um, species going extinct. That's the kinds of things we see reported in the news. But those events are underpinned by certain patterns, underlying structures, and ultimately by our mental models of how we have designed the world around us in the first place. And it's these deeper features of systems, the patterns, underlying structures, and mental models that really deserve our attention as well. So this is an alternative way of looking at social ecological systems. There are many other ways we can look at social ecological systems as well. The panicky model, for example, that many people know from the resilience literature emphasizes cross-scale relationships or a social network perspective emphasizes links between different actors. In our institute's logo, Jan Hansbach was inspired by the Celtic double spiral, which symbolizes the balance between opposing forces and such forces, for example, could be destruction and renewal or change and preservation. It's these kinds of opposites that we feel we have to navigate very frequently these days, and that's why um, this logo was chosen for the Institute. Our approach is interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary, as it probably should be for social ecological systems research, and much of our work is place-based. And I'll say more about the nature of this place-based work with some examples later on. We draw on natural sciences, social sciences, as well as sometimes the humanities, and with our work, we try to integrate the experiences, practices, and understandings from diverse knowledge systems. 
Over the next seven slides, I now just wanna highlight some key themes that we're especially interested in at our institute, not to say those are the only important themes for social ecological systems, but these are some of the themes that we currently perceive to be, uh, to be particularly interesting. The first one is simply um, good old biodiversity conservation. So conservation science um, is often forgotten now in social ecological systems research. Um, we actually still like to do some like if you like applied ecological science um, that simply asks conservation questions. For example, how do organisms respond to things like forest clearing, agricultural intensification, climate change, human resource exploitation. So those are the kinds of questions we're still interested in It's fundamental conservation science. An example here is work by Richard Gillibar on, um, on the connectivity between protected areas for elephants um, in sub-Saharan Africa. Biodiversity is interesting in its own right, but it also provides benefits to people. And those benefits, you might term them ecosystem services or nature's contributions to people more recently. Those benefits don't flow in the same way in all places or to all people. And that's something else we're interested in, a disaggregated analysis of ecosystem services and nature's contributions to people. So the example on the left here shows, for example, there are villages in Romania that are dominated by forest and those provide a diverse bundle of ecosystem services. Whereas for example, villages dominated by pastures provide a much more sparse bundle of ecosystem services. And different kinds of users obviously are also benefiting in different ways from nature in those places. But nature doesn't only provide services, but also disservices. For example, um, crop raiding is a problem we study in parts of Africa where um, ecosystem disservices are experienced in the sense that people's food security suffers as a result of living close to nature. While the material contributions of nature in a beneficial or not so beneficial way are important, there's more to nature than just these instrumental values. And for that reason, um, a growing area of research that we're also very interested in at our institute is that of relational values. Relational values is, for example, about the immaterial contributions of nature to human well-being, about human nature connectedness, or also about the ethical underpinnings of how we relate to nature and why we relate to nature, and how maybe different types of people, including indigenous people, relate to nature. The focus with relational values is quite different from instrumental values in the sense that their focus is specifically on the relationships themselves rather than necessarily only on the subjects or objects being related. So relational values is another um, sort of major research theme that we try to cover at our institute. Logically following from there is the topic of biocultural diversity. We have a junior research group led by Jan Hansbach on biocultural diversity at our institute and it specifically looks at how the cultural, how cultural diversity and um, biological diversity have co-evolved in particular places and how a better understanding of this co-evolution could ultimately potentially also benefit sustainability. Environmental justice is um, a fifth theme that I want to highlight. Environmental justice we've already touched upon when I talked about ecosystem services, so who gets what? that's distributive justice, but there are other aspects of environmental justice that are also very interesting and that are studied, for example, by Jacqueline Laws in our institute, um, procedural justice and recognitional justice. So how are people being treated in the process of, um, of environmental um, challenges uh, and are there, are there fundamental rights and cultures and uh, maybe local knowledge and so on, are those recognized? There are often different costs and benefits to different user groups, like I mentioned before, but also um, different implications for different uh, social groups, such as genders or wealth levels. And um, so power is a really important dimension here um, that needs to be looked at. Cross-scale governance is the sixth theme that I want to mention. So um, obviously we have uh, local scale effects of ecosystems on people, but um, so many things now are really driven by decisions and consumption patterns and so on in very remote places. And it's critical to get our heads around how different policies at different level, different actors at different levels, different formal and informal institutions, how all these things interact in a complex governance context to ultimately shape the environment and how people interact with the environment. So cross-scale governance is the sixth theme that I want to highlight. 
The seventh and last one is leverage points and transformation. This goes back to the idea of the iceberg, if you like. So often we've looked at systems on the surface. We've only looked at events and we've tried to remedy problems in the system by changing maybe the material flows in the system, planting a few trees here and there, or that sort of thing, making agriculture a little bit more efficient. And those things by and large have not really worked to fundamentally transform systems towards greater sustainability. To do that, we argue that we really need to be looking at deeper underlying leverage points for transformation. And that's what we try to do by looking, by taking, if you like, a leverage points perspective of systems, an idea that dates back to Donella Meadows and that we try to revive here um, at Leuphana University with Dave Absent taking the lead in an influential paper in 2017. So this leverage points perspective is something else we try to push to challenge the status quo of existing thinking about systems. Most of what we do is place-based, and I think many of us are quite proud of working in a place-based sort of context, and that is partly because it's nice to have good data, but it's also because working in real-world places serves as a vital reality check of whether the kinds of theories we come up with are at all relevant and reasonable and useful for um, particular places and the people and other organisms that live in these places. Much of our work is in rural landscapes, but not only. And much of our work is uh, currently in Latin America and Africa, not to say that other places aren't also interesting, but that's right now where a lot of our expertise is. Now, over the next slides, I'll just show a few examples of some current projects. So, for example, this is southwestern Ethiopia, and here we're asking how will landscape change influence where the benefits from this landscape flow? We use a range of different um, methods to answer this question, including ecological and social empirical fieldwork, but also scenario planning that engages local stakeholders. A similar kind of focus on the future um, also characterizes this work here in southeastern Australia, where the guiding question is how can farming and biodiversity conservation be integrated? And there, um, Different kinds of uh, methods have been used to elicit the perspectives of different stakeholders about viable farming and successful biodiversity conservation options in a Q study that was used where statements needed to be ranked by stakeholders, but also participatory workshops um, are being held um, that look at a backcasting kind of approach to the future. So asking what sort of future do you want? And then retrospectively from there figuring out, well, then what are the steps that need to be undertaken now to get to that desirable future? In the tropical dry forests of Mexico, um, a different kind of question is being asked, namely how can we foster biodiversity conservation, nature's contributions to people and farmers' quality of life? So that gets back to this question I raised before about ecosystem service bundles in different kinds of social ecological units and who gains under different kinds of management strategies um, in this particular landscape. Focusing on Sub-Saharan Africa, um, a project, a large project by Jacqueline Lewis and colleagues looks at protected areas and how they interact with environmental justice. There are a whole bunch of interesting areas, um, interesting sort of questions arising in the context of protected areas in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, trade-offs potentially between conservation and development. There are questions of resilience to external social or ecological shocks. And there are also very serious questions about post-colonialism in conservation because um, a lot of the conservation ideas and conservation parks in Africa now are to a large extent um, benefiting also Westerners who like to travel there and view um, African wildlife. So how does that work uh, from the perspective of, of environmental justice? So these are some of the questions that are being pursued there. I mentioned before, Jan Hansbach leads a junior research group on biocultural diversity. And the work of this group asks, how can biocultural diversity be harnessed to improve sustainability for that? And um, there's a large case study going on, an empirical case study in Bolivia, looking at aspects of agrobiodiversity economic practices gender and governance, as well as a comparative study that compares different landscapes around the global south with respect to this relationship between biocultural diversity and sustainability, working closely with actors in society, so it's a transdisciplinary cooperation, and the guiding question here is how these three things can be linked, biocultural diversity, um, so biological diversity, cultural diversity, and sustainability ultimately. 
A last example, this one comes from Germany. Here, the question is more on governance of ecosystem services. How, how does governance of natural and anthropogenic capitals contribute to the supply, distribution, and demand of ecosystem services in different land management settings? And this particular um, project is part of the biodiversity exploratories, which are long-term ecological research sites in Germany. So that's just to give you an overview of the kinds of questions that we're currently excited about at our institute. And of course, when we have our conversation later on, and you can either agree with these, complement them, um, or maybe even disagree with some of what we think is important. At our institute, just a few last slides uh, to give you a sense of who we are and what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, we're a mixture of people, just like in any normal university institutions, um, institution professors, postdocs, PhD students, um, and other kinds of students. We also have some people affiliated with us with a secondary affiliation, for example, from the Institute of Ecology, and also some visiting fellows. And overall, one thing that we really enjoy on a day to day basis is that our group is really highly international. So the people in our corridors have grown up in many different parts of the world, and we really value and like that diversity. We also try to be relatively active with one another, as well as uh, in terms of our scientific activities. The latter is quite interesting because sometimes being active means just driven by more and more and doing more and more. And we see a lot of that in academia. What we try to do is not just do that, but instead we try to have an approach to productivity that is what we would call collaborative and careful. And I've written careful like that here to emphasize this aspect of care. We really do try to create a workplace culture that is collaborative, collegiate, and respectful of people's interests, but also of their time and boundaries, something that is not so common these days in academia, where often we feel like we're in some sort of a rat race where just more is always better. So we're saying a clear no to more is better. And we hope that a nice workplace culture instead as a byproduct generates a good amount of quality in our work as well as a good amount of quantity. If you're interested more in this idea of care in academia, then attend our next session, which is a panel discussion specifically on this idea. And um, I'll show the title of that at the end of this talk. And then you can join next time and, and add your views on how to make academia as a whole a more careful place. We collaborate widely in international networks such as PECS, IPBS, or the Ecosystem Services Partnership. Of course, we have lots of specific partners for different projects in the different places where we work. And we're also really interested to host international scientists or new junior research groups um, now and in the future via existing funding schemes that exist for that, such as the ERC funding schemes or the Alexander von Humboldt um, schemes, of which there are several that are useful to attract people to come to Germany. If you're interested to find out more about our institute specifically, then you can get our annual reports on the website, the current ones up there right now. The future one will be up in January for 2021. And you can also follow our blog, um, which is given here, or follow us on Twitter. The blog typically features a new publication from the Institute every week. Finally, then, if you are at our website, maybe take a look at our vision and mission statement, um, where we summarize some of the sort of ethos of what I've summarized in this, um, in this little presentation now today. That's pretty much it in terms of my input presentation on where we currently see some priorities for social ecological systems. As I said, other people are most welcome to have complementary or different ideas, otherwise it would be pretty boring. Mm -hmm. Let me end by just highlighting um, that these are the next few dates you might want to um, know about. So November the 18th um, will be a panel discussion, a caring ethos in transdisciplinary sustainability science, a dialogue. Um, in January, we will hear about environmental justice and area-based conservation approaches. And then finally, we'll learn more about biocultural diversity and why we should care about it in our session in February. I'll leave it at that for now. And with that, I think we can open our session for discussion. Thank you very much.